I think that this might have come up in my, briefly at least, in my conversations with both of you separately. But this, of course, is the time to talk about it in a bit more de- bit more detail or depth. And that's how you two knew David Lewis. And maybe just a bit about who he was and what he meant to you. Because I know he was your friend. He, he was your friend. He was your philosophical colleague. I think at least in your case, Frank, he was something of like a philosophical idol. Well, I think it's probably true that Frank knew him better than I did. But um, background. Okay, so... Um, David was, of course, an American philosopher. He worked at Princeton for most of his life. Um, but for some reason, he loved Australian philosophy. And maybe I'll leave that bit for Frank to fill in, at least initially. Um, and David and his wife, Steffi, came to Australia um, every northern summer for 20-plus years. Um, and David was a terrific philosopher, of course. Um, but also, he... He not only enjoyed doing philosophy, he enjoyed doing philosophy with other people. So when he came to Australia, he would get around, he'd come to the annual conference, he'd go to departments, he'd give papers, uh, he'd talk to, he'd give a lot of his time to graduate students. He loved arguing about philosophy, not in a point scoring way, but just for the joy of trying to get to the bottom of some philosophical issue. Um, So uh, over the summer visits, um, I think most Australian philosophers saw a lot of David um, at conferences and departmental visits. And um, uh, I, I was one of those philosophers. And I enjoyed crossing swords with David. Um, it, you always learn whether, you know, you, you ended up agreeing with him or not. Um, but uh, it was always a pleasure to be with him. Uh, and one, one, one last thing for I had up to Frank. Uh, he, he always travelled with Steffi, his wife. <clears throat> and David was, in a way, very sociable. But um, he, he, he really enjoyed talking about philosophy, but not so much other things. So he, he would always leave the socialisation to Steffi. Um, so when you were at dinner, it was always with David and Steffi, and Steffi was a very sociable person. Uh, and David was obviously enjoying the social conversation, but he was always happy to leave non-philosophical talk to, to Steffi. But once he started talking philosophy, then then the kind of the philosophical David kicked in, and we might talk more about what that was like in due course. Okay, over to you, Frank. Well, picking up on the last point, um... We occasionally had dinner parties, as you'd expect. And after one of these, Steffi took me aside and said, that was great fun. Thank you very much. But you should understand what David really enjoys Mm -hmm. is arguing. Uh, uh, And she partly meant philosophical argument, which Graham's just been talking about. And, of course, that was one of the reasons he was such a wonderful visitor to the country, because he did so much interacting with Everybody, uh, you know, old people, young people, important people, famous people, not famous people. Um, as long as they were doing philosophy, that got a big tick. Or oh, correction, as long as they were doing good philosophy. Um, sometimes he would glaze over slightly if people started saying r- r- really r- ridiculous things. <laughs> I don't mean by ridiculous things he didn't believe, because as Graham says, he was very hospitable to views which he didn't agree with and was more than more than prepared to interact. And that was a great, great plus. Um, but to go back to what Steffi said, it was partly he loved arguing about philosophy, but also he loved arguing in general. So he would be quite keen to perhaps argue about certain issues of the day. Um, in fact, he wrote a, a very nice paper on nuclear deterrence. But it was the, the to and fro of ideas and argument, uh, which I think particularly animated him. Uh, on a more personal front, I first met him when he came to Monash as a visiting professorship. Uh, we had a sort of special arrangement to bring people in from outside Australia to spend some weeks giving lectures at Monash. So I'd never met him before, so I picked him up at the airport and so on. And he gave a terrific set of lectures, and they weren't just – 
a terrific set of lectures. He also answered questions really well. And uh, I'm sure Graham will back me up on this. In Australia, you get lots of visitors. Uh, and by and large, you expect they're very good philosophers. That's, that's why get, they get invited. Uh, the papers they give are usually pretty good, but they're not always <laughs> terrific. And they vary in how good they are in responding to objections and questions, both in the discussion period and afterwards in general chit-chat. Uh, and David was right up the top in the list of people who were good at answering questions from the audience and good at interacting afterwards. And it comes for that interacting right. beforehand about philosophy. And that was one of the reasons that um, he was such a wonderful visitor and such a wonderful person to yeah. um, interact with. But he, he had many um, unusual mannerisms, shall we say, and we might talk about some of those. But one of them was that he actually thought before he answered questions. Um, so you'd ask a question, and then there'd be this silence. And the silence could actually go on for a long time. I remember when he came to Perth once, we went driving, and I took him inland to the Null Nullarbor. Um, and, of course, we chatted as we were driving. And I remember one occasion when I asked him a question, and there was this silence. And I don't know how long it was, but, you know, these things can seem interminable. And I thought, hmm. Did he hear what I said? Has he forgotten? Is he ignoring me? But, you know, after what seemed like, you know, a lifetime, it was probably only a couple of minutes, he gave him the answer. Um, and, you know, uh, this was typical. David thought long and hard before he would reply. Um, and he wouldn't go, uh, or um, you know, the things that the rest of us do to, to tell the other person that there's something going on between the ears. David was just silent. But when he replied, out came this perfectly formed answer. You know, you'd ask him a question, and as Frank said, his answers were always, I mean, good philosophers like David hit the question. They don't bullshit around it. They answer the question. And out will come a perfect answer supported by, you know, three arguments, two possible objections, three possible counter replies, all beautifully presented. I mean, of course, David was really always very clear, very organized, very structured, and, and very cogent as well. So this was one of his kind of um, personal mannerisms, shall we say. You're just following up on that. What Graham says is absolutely right. Sometimes it, well, Sometimes I picked him up at the airport or somewhere or drove him from one place to another for a seminar and exactly what Graham has described happened. But on the odd occasion, something else happened. He would give the answer and then he'd say, I've been thinking about this and then what would follow would be a whole <laughs> paper. <laughs> and a, a couple of years later, you'd see this paper in a leading journal. Now, it wouldn't be exactly as you'd heard it, but it was quite uncanny. Um, it wasn't just, as Graham said, he had organised replies to individual questions. He had whole ways of thinking about a topic. And if you were lucky enough to be, as Graham says, in a car, <laughs> or in one case, um, sitting at our dinner table, you'd get the whole paper. Indeed, just to follow up on this, as you know, that, no, I, I wrote a paper called Epiphenomenal Qualia many years ago, and David had a reply to it. So David read the paper, and he, I forget the exact details, and he came back to our house for dinner, and I was cooking dinner. And David gave the whole of his ability reply <laughs> to epiphenomenal qualia while I was struggling <laughs> with the pots and pans and saying the tail and so <laughs> This all came out, this really very interesting response to the knowledge argument. Yeah. And uh, this, um, if I can just sort of pick up, um, is it okay if we play tag team memory memorabilia? Um, <laughs> I mean, Frank's comment sort of illustrates something else about David. Some 
some philosophers had big pictures, okay, and they are intent on sort of, you know, explaining their big pictures. Um, David did have a sort of big picture, but he was always fired off by other people's problems. So, you know, you'd, you'd, ex you'd be talking about something. He'd go to a conference, hear a paper or whatever, and he'd get really interested in this. And then uh, he would engage with that problem and formulate an answer and a, a theory about it. And often, you know, this the, the little bits of problem and solution would get packed into a bigger picture in the end. But he was always first and foremost in in he really loved engaging in philosophical problems and trying to figure out what the answers were. And um, uh, that that was a, a very distinctive feature about David. Well, drawing together uh, a lot of what you've said, but maybe drawing most on what you both had to say about David's penchant for argument. Graham, you said that he enjoyed arguing about philosophy, but not in a point scoring sort of way, but to get oh. to the bottom of issues. And in the volume that you two edited uh, in 2004, I think David passed away in 2001. So your volume is Lewisian Themes, The Philosophy of David K. Lewis. But you two mentioned in the introduction that he treated objections to his work in print, at least, very differently from many other philosophers, and namely that he, he took them seriously and would write copious sort of postscripts uh, defending his views, or uh, I don't know if you wrote that he would alter them to accommodate these objections. But do you see his attitude toward objections and argument as telling us something that more philosophers should be doing or doing differently? Do you want to go first? Well, the short answer is yes. I think Dave Graham's going to say the same. Um, just a bit of background. Of course, in the Australian context, David Armstrong was famous for responding to objections. So when David Armstrong wrote his big book on materialist theory of the mind, he roneoed off. This is before the days of, um, you know, Modern technology, you had that, you know, the thing you turn the thing around in the department office and it came out. Um, Robinson, you're too young to know about this, <laughs> but it came out. <laughs> All right. It, you know, it came out. Uh, it was perfectly readable. Uh, and uh, Armstrong would set this um, manuscript around and respond to objections. So that particular tradition of responding to objections was very much, uh, well, it was very Australian in a way. I mean, it's also true of Jack Smart. Jack Smart's famous paper on sensations and brain processes. Remember, there's the bit where he says what he thinks, and there's the bit where he replies to all the objections. Um, and this is partly, I think, why David liked Australian philosophy so much. It was that to and fro obligation to re reply to objections. What was special about David Lewis, of course, was that he was extremely good at it. <laughs> I mean, Armstrong was pretty good at it, <laughs> and Jack was pretty good at it. But I think David Lewis was quite unusually yeah. good at it. No, I, I agree with what Frank said. Um, let, let me kind of say a little bit more, but approach this sideways slightly. Um, David enjoyed arguing, okay? Um, and you might hear that exactly the wrong way because lots of people argue to win, point, win, a, win an argument, show how good they are, show they're better than the people they're arguing with. And this was not David at all. Um, David argued because he was really interested in solutions to problems. And um, he formulate theories and um, he'd defend them against objections. Sometimes he'd give them up. Uh, sometimes the people he was arguing with were persuaded by him. But what was centre to, let, let's call it a discussion rather than argument, was always the problem. And David was never interested in just winning points or showing he was smarter than you um, or anybody else. He just wanted to get to the bottom of philosophical issues. And um, I think I agree with Frank that this has always been um, a feature of Australian philosophy. Um, Australia, Australian conferences uh, are not well 
I don't know quite how to put this. There are some countries which shall remain nameless where international conferences and so on are very much dominated by people who want to show how good they are. And Australia, to one, one of the things I love about Australian philosophy is that people who are into this, have this attitude, are very few and far between. So you can get discussions at conferences and papers, everyone chips in. And as Frank said, they might be sort of heavies, they might be older established people, they might be grad students, they might be visitors who like it, doing philosophy. So they, they all put their heads together and try and sort out, you know, solutions to problems. And I do agree with, with Frank that uh, one of the reasons that David loved coming to Australia, which he did, was because this was the way that was philosophy was done. And um, he enjoyed just being in the thick of a, a philosophical debate, not to show how good he was or to point score or to come out on top, but just because he enjoyed the back and forth of philosophical, Australian philosophical argument. <laughs> 